Good evening. In last week's specially extended edition of World in Action, we investigated serious allegations about police corruption at high levels and about alleged attempts to obstruct Operation Countryman in its work of exposing crooked police officers. Following the program, there were calls at Westminster and in Fleet Street for a new top-level inquiry. Last week, we invited the Home Secretary, William Whitelaw, the Director of Public Prosecution, Sir Thomas Hetherington, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Sir David McNee, and his Deputy, Mr. Patrick Kavner, to take part in a follow-up program tonight. All four declined. But the invitation remains open, and we hope to return to the subject in the next week or two. But tonight, another subject, and in its way, just as disturbing. Today, apart from emergency services, every National Health Service hospital in the country came to a virtual standstill as the health service unions began five days intensive industrial action. It's the most severe disruption the health service has ever seen, a week of demonstrations and stoppages in pursuit of a 12% pay claim by health service workers. What this action means in practice is fewer operations and a swelling of the already massive queues for hospital beds. In the wards, it means Spartan conditions, soiled bed linen and cold meals. Tonight, World in Action looks at the workers' claim and asks if their strike is worth the hardship it will cause. And we talk to people representing a cross-section of the health service, from top consultants to hospital porters. While they may differ about taking strike action, they all agree that if the health service is to survive, it needs a massive injection of public money and a renewed political commitment to its future by the government. The minister responsible for the health service is Norman Fowler, Secretary of State for Social <coughs> Services, and he too is in our studio to answer his critics. We'll be hearing from the minister later. But first, Sir Sidney Hamburger, until recently chairman of the Northwest Regional Health Authority. Perhaps surprisingly for a health service boss, Sir Sidney has publicly complained to the minister about the unnecessarily harsh treatment of hospital staff. Strong words, Sir Sidney. Why did you use them? Well, because when we were told this year what the allocations were going to be for the region, we were told that there was going to be an allowance of 4% for pay awards and 9% for price increases. We said we could manage with the 9% for prices, but we said from the word go that it was quite unfair to try and tie people to a 4% pay award in this day. So the government has um, mishandled the current pay round, in your opinion? I think they completely mishandled it because even within the health service they had different rates. 4% for ancillary staff, 6% for nurses, 7% for doctors. It's divisive in the first place. As a top administrator, Sir Sidney, are you aware of declining standards in the health service? Oh yes, I'm quite sure that the sense of commitment has gone from very, very many people. You see, the health service is always being knocked about by politicians. We're constantly told there are going to be changes. We're constantly told there's going to be reorganisation. And as a result of this, the staff feel uncertain about their future, they are in doubt about their career prospects, and at a time like this, you can't expect the same sense of commitment as in a period where there's peace. What effect has this had on the actual uh, level of, of services within the hospitals? Well, the strike action now, of course, and the reduction in money available is going to have a serious effect. We're going to, we call it rationalisation. It really means we're going to have to close wards down because we haven't got enough staff to keep them open. And what is morale like in the health service? I've never known morale to be lower in the health service. There's no lack of support for Sir Sidney's view that the health service is in trouble. Last month, the chairman of the British Medical Association, Tony Grabham, said, the allocation to health is clearly inadequate either to provide the kind of service we all believe to be necessary or to reward its workers fairly. Let's look at a specific case. Dr. Michael Joseph is a children's heart specialist at Guy's Hospital in London. Large teaching hospitals like Guy's are traditionally well off and the treatment of sick children is a priority area within the health service. Dr. Joseph, nobody wants to see the treatment of sick babies and children decline. Is it slipping? It certainly is. For an example, three weeks ago at Guy's we had to tr close a children's ward, an in intensive care area and restrict our admissions of newborn babies. Why was that? This was because we're overspending at the rate of £12,000 per month, mainly on nursing staff. 
If you can't get the money from central government, how do you manage to raise it? We have to raise money for in, from every area that we can, but particularly in the past, we've raised this for equipment. But for raising it for nursing staff, uh, for salaries, for that sort of number is a very difficult job. Does this mean that a top consultant like yourself is actually using his valuable time uh, for fundraising? I'm certainly using a lot of my time, that is so. Uh, is the situation that you're describing in your hospital unusual or is this the general rule throughout the service? This is just a reflection of what is happening throughout the country and in particular in the intensive care in newborn units where a recent survey has shown that 90% of these newborn units are understaffed. Do you support today's industrial action? Won't it do further harm to the National Health Service? Certainly it does have a disruptive effect on the health service, but it may be the only way that people can protest. But I would like to point out that the government action with cash limits has a much greater effect on the health service than any industrial action partly because it's arbitrary and partly because it's permanent. If there's one group of British workers who everybody wants to see get a fair deal, it's the nurses. After the last bout of industrial action in the health service, part of the so-called winter of discontent, the nurses were given a large catching up award. But since that 1979 award, the nurses have been falling behind again in the wage race. In 1980, the gap between the nurses' rise and the inflation rate was 9%. Last year, 6%. And if the nurses accept the government's latest offer, they'll be 2% down this year. The gap is getting smaller, but even so, the nurses' standard of living continues to decline. Mary Ierson is a ward sister at the University Hospital of Wales in Cardiff. She moved a motion for nurses to go on strike at the recent annual conference of NUPI. Sister Ierson, nurses haven't taken all-out strike action before. Why should they do so now? Well, I don't think that any nurse ever wants to go on strike, but I believe that more and more nurses are realising now, really through the intransigence of this government, that it's the only way in which we're going to uh, get a decent wage rise. You talk about a decent wage rise. How low are your existing wages? Well, for instance, myself, if I didn't work a weekend, my take-home pay would be somewhere in the region of £70, and that's for a ward sister in charge of a 32-bedded ward in an acute hospital. What about uh, younger nurses? £45 a week for a student nurse. Is your hospital short of staff? Are your nurses overworked? Well, I'd say that every nurse is overworked. I'd say that no nurse ever completes her work in the way that she'd like to. Aren't you concerned about patients suffering as a result of this industrial action? It's been said that uh, uh, some patients may well die because of it. Well, I originally came into nursing to help people uh, ease their suffering, and I'm sure everyone else went into nursing for that reason. I don't think anyone went in for it for the pay. But I think that we've come to the situation now where the government is making us suffer so we've got to do something. What's going to happen to the nursing profession if the uh, government digs in and doesn't give you any more money? Well, to be honest, it's, it's going to be disbanded, as I see it. Nurses are going to move away to Saudi Arabia, for instance, where they can now earn £16,000 a year, tax-free. Is that happening at your hospital? Oh, yes. Until now, nurses have been less willing to take industrial action than the more traditionally militant hospital ancillary workers. These are the porters, cleaners, cooks and drivers who are essential to the running of the National Health Service. Brenda Lineker is a cleaner in Prestwich Psychiatric Hospital in Manchester. Mrs Lineker, how much do you earn? £68 gross, but my take-home pay is £48.20. And how far does that money have to go? Do you have a family to support on I it? I do have a family to support. Um, it supplements my husband's wages, whose job is very dicey. There's redundancy holding over his head. Um, you know, I don't go out to work for pin money. I go out to work to supplement the, the household budget. Can you um, afford holidays on your money? No, we can't afford a holiday. Uh, it's very rare for us to have a holiday. We've had one in about ten years. What do you feel about industrial action? I feel it's the only way we're going to make the government realise 
that we are so badly paid. Um, and this militant bit about Ansara's being militant, we're not militants at all, we've just got no choice. Turning to you, Mick Foster, you're a hospital porter and UP shop steward at St Thomas's Hospital uh, in London. How much public support can you expect to get for a campaign which appears to be directed uh, against the sick and the infirm? I think we're getting a lot of public support. It's not only a fight for the 12%, it's a fight to keep the health service open and stop all the privatisation which this government wants to bring in. If you and your fellow ancillary workers are so badly paid, can you afford to go on strike and lose your wages? We can't afford to go on strike, but it's the only thing we can do in the position what we have been put in. Why? Why? I mean, um, our, our money's no good to live on, quite frankly. I mean, not many people can live on our money. We have worked out in our hospital there'd be one or two people who would be better off on the social security. Last week, the Department of Health took space in national newspapers to advertise the value of the latest pay offer. They pointed out it was in line with pay settlements for doctors, teachers, civil servants and the armed forces. The government didn't draw attention to other recent pay awards for the judges, a healthy 18.5%, and for the police, 10.3%. Both of these awards make health unions angry. The biggest union in the NHS is NUPI, the National Union of Public Employees, which represents over half the workers in the health service. They orchestrated the winter of discontent in 1978-9. Their general secretary is Rodney Bickerstaff. Mr Bickerstaff, by calling your members out this week, you're effectively taking on a hard-line Conservative government. What makes you think that you'll succeed where ASLEF and the NUR failed? Firstly, there's the issue. The issue is low pay of dedicated work people who year in and year out look after the health and welfare of our sick, our disabled and our dying. Secondly, because our people are determined on this occasion that they're not going to be, continue to be exploited as they have been over the years. And thirdly, because we've got proven support, not just of the public, not just of the patients, many of whom have been on picket lines with us, but we've got the support of the hospital authorities and we've got the support of thousands of trade unionists up and down the country. You talk about uh, public support, but how much public support can you retain? Um, by waging a campaign apparently against the patients, by seeing to it that they have to exist in, in dirty wards, eat cold meals and wait even longer for their operations? Well, in fact, over the years, if successive governments had put more money into the health of the nation, perhaps we wouldn't be in the position that we are now. You want 12% for your health workers, but what will you settle for, Mr Bickerstaff? Well, it's not for me. It's for no individual union to say what we're prepared to settle for. The strength of this dispute has been that all the workers in the health service have stood shoulder to shoulder and have shown how determined they are. The settlement will be reached when the government returns to the negotiating table with a proper offer. 6% and 7.5% to low-paid people is just not on. But the government has shown a certain amount of flexibility. They've improved their offer twice, haven't they? Now, why don't you show a bit of flexibility by lowering your demands to a more realistic figure? Uh, uh, we showed flexibility before we came to the negotiating table. 12% is a very, very realistic request. In fact, if we'd really wanted to eradicate low pay, we would have asked for a lot more than 12%. There's one group of health workers which has not accepted the call for industrial action this week, and that's the Royal College of Nurses, who are forbidden by their constitution from going on strike. The RCN are currently balloting their members, who include nearly half of Britain's nurses, on the government's latest pay offer of 7.5%. If they accept the new offer, the ranks of the workers will be split, but if they reject it, the government will face a degree of unity among the workforce in the health service that has never been seen before. Ian Hargreaves is the chairman of the Royal College's Industrial Relations Committee. Mr Hargreaves, surely such a vocationally minded group as the RCN will not encourage the strikers by rejecting what the government has made clear is a final offer to the nurses. The offer 
now on now before us is only just over one percent more than the previous offer at 6.4 i don't think it will be necessarily sufficient to convince many of our members to change their vote to accept this they, they wouldn't didn't accept 6.4 percent now you've been offered seven and a half percent and really that's not a bad offer when you consider um what other workers in the public sector are uh, having to settle for why don't you urge your nurses to take it i think we've got to look at the starting point and nurses have started from a low um, level and secondly I think you've got to look at two awards that have been made recently the judges and the police uh, but the government says that seven and a half percent is its final offer that there's no more money available do you dispute this I don't dispute that that's their view I, I think if they had the willingness to find more money and one looks at the contingency reserve there was the Falklands crisis okay a national emergency that drew on the contingency reserve there's more money there they can find the money for the judges at 18 percent they are finding 10.3 percent for the police so I believe that had their, their willingness the money is there what will be the effect if hospitals themselves have to fund uh, additional wages out of existing budgets there's three possible ways of doing this as I see it. One is that new buildings won't go ahead or that there will be jobs not filled and there's already a shortage of nurses as pointed out previously or that certainly one hospital authority I know of, know of would meet this shortfall by closing for example a 24 bedded acute surgical or medical ward. What emerges from these interviews is an alarming picture of a health service in which standards of care are falling and in which morale has reached rock bottom. The minister in charge is the Secretary of State for Social Services, Norman Fowler. Uh, Mr Fowler, there may not be unanimous support for strike action, but clearly right across the health service spectrum, there's deep concern about its future, and many people feel that it's understaffed and underfunded. What do you say? Well, I don't think that. Could I also, right at the beginning, pick up the introductory remarks you used to this programme? where you said that every hospital came to a virtual standstill today. That really is not the case. The significant thing about today has been that thousands of health workers have continued to work. And really, I think it is most important that that point is made. And will that continue to be the case throughout the rest of the week? Well, I can't predict any more than you can, but if it goes in the same way as the three-day dispute did uh, about three or four days ago, then it will. I'm in no way minimising the damage that industrial action is causing, but I think it is important important to recognize the uh, fact that so many people are continuing to work. Now you ask about the funding of the health service. The fact of the matter is that this government is spending more on the health service than any other government in the history of national health. But we're still spending less on health than uh, most other Western nations. We have increased by 5% in real terms since 1979. Uh, the amount being spent on health at a time when other services have had to be cut. This is not a service which has been cut, this is a service which has been increased. We have increased the amount of GDP going to the health service. I mean, that is the fact of the situation. We are now spending £14.5 billion pounds a year on the national health. That, I hope, gives you some indication of the commitment, not only of myself, but of the government uh, to the National Health Service, which I profoundly believe in. Yes, but surely it's unacceptable that senior consultants like Dr Joseph should be spending their valuable time fundraising in order to keep hospital wards open. Well, there's always been an element of fundraising, and if I may say so, I saw the point that Dr Joseph's made, and we are, uh, in fact, I have asked a report on the position as far as uh, guys is concerned. But nevertheless, one can't go to get away from the fact uh, that the amount of resources that this government is putting into the health service, taxpayers' money, and it's 85% comes from the taxpayer, has been increased and is increasing over the coming 12 months. But you would agree, Minister, that your cash limits mean that many hospitals cannot operate at capacity and that patients have to wait even longer for a hospital bed. No, I wouldn't agree with that. We did not introduce cash limits. Cash limits were introduced in the middle of the 1970s by the last Labour government. Cash limits can be used either way. One of the ways that we're using cash limits is for the expansion uh, of the health service. Now, before this industrial dispute began, we had, in fact, reduced waiting lists inside the National Health Service. We'd reduced them by 130,000. Now, during the two, three months of this dispute, half that improvement, 65,000, um, has gone back again. Industrial action has caused much more damage 
uh, than uh, any underfunding that you might claim on, far, on the part of the health service. And I think there was a very important question, uh, which I think should be directed at some of your uh, panelists who have spoken, um, and that is, do they really believe that industrial action is justified uh, in the uh, current position? And I really do think that that is the most fundamental question that everyone inside the health service should now address. Well, we'll come to that in a, in a moment, Mr. Fowler. But first, isn't it a false economy to pay expensively trained nurses so little money that they actually leave the National Health Service? Well, there's, there are comparatively few who are leaving the National Health Service, and we have, in fact, improved and increased the number of nurses actually employed in the National Health Service. We've increased over the last two and a half years by something like 34,000. These, again, are the facts of the matter. Because we have put in more resources in this area, more resources means, in fact, more people, and the, the most of the more people uh, have been as nurses and in the increase in nurses. And could I make another point about nurses? What we've also tried very desperately to do is to get into place a new permanent arrangement for nurses' pay. I badly want to see this. I uh, very much want to see this, and I think that many people inside the Royal College of Nursing uh, would want to see this as well. But do you intend to give the nurses any more money this year? No, I must make it clear that we have moved. I think you made the point in your interview yourself. We have moved. We've moved up from the pay factor that Sidney Hamburger mentioned of 4%, up to between 6 and 7.5%. And, and, and that's your final offer? And that is the final decision. You say there's only so much money in the kitty, but what our panel has been saying tonight, surely, is that you should go back to your masters in the treasury and to your mistress at 10 Downing Street and ask for a bigger departmental budget for the National Health Service. No, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, let me make that absolutely clear. I would not want to do that. The National Health Service has a record budget. We have got a budget of 14 and a half billion pounds, and we must live within that budget. If you go to other services and ask them how they have fared over the last two or three years because of the improvements that we have tried to make in the economy generally, uh, you will find a different story, but this is not the story in health. I'd like to open the discussion out at this stage and bring in our panel and ask them whether they think that the government should be able to find more money for the National Health Service. Well, yes, the money is there. Britain is a rich nation, one of the richest nations in the world, and a nation as civilised as our so-called ought to be able to find the money for the health of its nation. It won't come by wasting £80,000 of public funds in order to put propaganda adverts in our newspapers. What we need is a political decision by the government to use their priorities, put money on the table now, for our low-paid workers. When you talk about money on the table, presumably uh, it's got to be raised from uh, the uh, taxpayers. In other words, more taxes. What do you think, Dr. Joseph? I think the taxpayer would be prepared to pay more, but uh, I can't really speak for the taxpayer. But what I can say is that they already pay for the health service and they're entitled to a good service. May I also bring up the point with Mr. Fowler? He says that more money has been pumped into the health service, and this is absolutely true, but it can't be sufficient, otherwise all the workers and the hospitals are, wouldn't be complaining about the underfunding, particularly of the nursing staff. Mrs Lineker, I believe you've got a point you want to raise with the Minister. Yes, how, would he, how can he justify, given as a 6% increase, how would he like to keep a family on £48 a week? I'd like to see him try it. There you are, Mr Fowler. Well, that, of course, is not a typical, um, a, a, a typical salary. But what I would, how I would uh, like to that try to sum up salary. that discussion, how I'd like to sum up that salary. discussion, uh, is this. This government is actually spending more on the health service than any other government has done. That represents a real increase, uh, not only an actual increase in cash, but a real increase that we're putting into the health service. Now, I want to see a good health service getting value for money and with high morale. We're not going to be able to solve all the problems of the health uh, service in one year. I have offered talks on new arrangements, new pay arrangements, not just for the nurses and midwives, but also for other people working inside the health service as well. I believe that the offer that I have made, our final offer, of the 6 to 7.5% is a fair offer, 
and it is certainly the government's final decision, I hope above all that we can get back talking at the Whitley Council and Mr Bickerstaff and his union colleagues talking with me about new arrangements and I hope that industrial action can cease and we can stop uh, damaging patient care in the way that it has been damaged. What well, thank is the... I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Thank you Mr Fowler and thanks to our health service panel. Well, unless the uh, government or the unions have a sudden change of heart, which doesn't seem very likely on what we've heard tonight, we face four more days of industrial action. Your good health. Good night.